Good afternoon, everyone from a very sunny Nairobi here in East Africa. Welcome to our very first edition of the series on empowering African youth in the energy transition. Our focus for today is on green skills for the future energy workforce, particularly in the region of Africa. And I would like us to start by introducing ourselves in the chat box to tell us who you are, where you're from, and perhaps um, what you're looking forward to, to, to today's discussion. The sequence of the webinar is as follows. So we will start off with a keynote address and then followed by a panel session discussion. And then we'll have time um, at the end of the hour for a Q&A session. And finally, a wrap up and a summary of whatever the summary of the discussion. So this webinar is one and the first of three webinars in the series. And in this hour, we will explore the crucial role that green skills have and will continue to play in Africa's energy ecosystem. As you may be aware, Africa's energy landscape is undergoing a transformative shift towards sustainable practices with an increasing focus on clean energy sources. And according to recent reports, Africa has abundant renewable energy resources, and yet there is a significant gap in harnessing these potentials due to various challenges. The future workforce in the clean energy sector will require diverse skills spanning from technical expertise in renewable energy technologies to policy advocacy to project management and so on, thereby investing in the development of green skills not only addresses unemployment, but also promotes economic growth, energy security and environmental sustainability across the continent. Hence, our discussion will explore these range of green skills which are currently in high demand within the energy sector in Africa and how educational institutions, businesses, public and private sectors can collaborate to promote the green skills development and create job opportunities. I will be your moderator for today. My name is Cherop Soy and I am the SDG7 Global Youth Ambassador for the Pan-African region. And without further ado, I would like to welcome Akil Kalinda, the Youth Specialist at SE for All to give us the keynote address. Akil, over to you. Thank you, Charop. I uh, just wanna quickly confirm that everyone can hear me. Nice. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone on the call, depending on where you're tuning in from. Um, it's really an honor to be here and speak with you today um, to the persons in the audience and also to my esteemed panelists um, who I'm really excited to hear speak in the, in the panel discussion that will follow this address. Um, and yeah, it's really an honor to be here to speak with you about a topic that is really, really crucial, um, not only for the achievement of SDG 7, but it's also directly tied to enabling career opportunities that both contribute to sustainable development and the alleviation of poverty um, for the generations that will follow the urgency and importance of green skills. As a youth specialist at SE for All, I'm particularly passionate about the pivotal role that young people are already playing and will continue to play in driving the transition to a sustainable energy future. According to the 2023 Tracking SDG 7 report, 675 million persons still lack access to electricity, with the majority of these persons located in Sub-Saharan Africa. In turn, 70% of Sub-Saharan Africa's population is under the age of 30. So you can see that Africa's youth are one of the primary demographics experiencing the challenges around lack of access to energy and are already advocating for their active and meaningful inclusion in the development of solutions that are sustainable. So how can we empower Africa's youth? How can we engage all African youth from those who are aware of the problems and are already seeking entry points into the clean energy sector? That might be many of you on this call. To so those who do not yet understand the criticality of the issue or the opportunities that exist for them to get involved. So one of the answers actually lies in the development of green skills. Green skills which encompass the knowledge, abilities and attitudes necessary to develop and support sustainable practices. These are essential to addressing these challenges. They offer a critical opportunity to both empower youth and enable Africa's achievement of SDG 7. So to develop these skills is not just an option that we have, it's an imperative for our survival and prosperity. To build a sustainable future, we do need a workforce equipped with a diverse set of skills. And of course, I wanna take a second to underline this diverse element. 
So we need skills in renewable energy technologies, as I stated, such as solar, wind, and geothermal power. And we also know that we need skills in energy storage, smart grid technology, and energy efficiency. These are crucial. However, the point that I really want to drive home today, particularly to our young listeners, and perhaps to set, help set the tone for this discussion, is that there is a wider ecosystem of skills that are needed to help enable the clean energy transition. And this is something that Cherub touched on in her introduction. So I want to take you on a little journey with me to help you to help illustrate this concept. For a moment, let's consider a company that has been tasked with developing a utility or large scale solar PV. This is, this is common knowledge to help design and install the systems. But what about the business side? We know that we would need persons skills in sales and marketing to help secure business opportunities, operation. There's the need for health and safety expertise and persons with knowledge of potential environmental impacts. And who ensures that these projects are delivered on time and within budget and that all the moving pieces fit? We need project managers to achieve this. Of course, we can't forget the critical role that internal facing human resource personnel play in finding the right talent, ensuring diversity and equity, and ensuring that the show runs smoothly on the people's side. And if we take an even further step back, consider the wider supply chain, we can see a further need for persons skilled in resource gathering, manufacturing of components, logistics, and transportation. And we still need to think about the persons responsible for creating the enabling environment that attracts developers and makes projects viable. This requires policymakers, economists, regulators, and legislators, to name a few. And last but not least, we can't forget the teachers and trainers needed to deliver all of these skills that are needed for the green energy transition. So to bring you back to the start, this is just one project using one form of clean energy. When we consider the magnitude of clean energy generation technologies, well, generation up, up, across all the available technologies from wind, solar, geothermal, hydropower, biofuels, batteries, all of these technologies that have a part to play in Africa's clean energy transition and for the delivery of SDG 7 there's clearly a massive opportunity for youth to come in and fill this gap, but they can't do so on their own. So how do we deliver these skills to the youth of Africa? Education and training are the cornerstones of developing green skills. Our educational institutions must integrate sustainability and energy focus criteria into their curricula at all levels. On the other hand, online courses and certifications offer flexible and often more accessible learning opportunities to young people. And it's through a robust and adaptive education system that we can ensure our youth are well prepared to meet the demands of the green economy. Creating a sustainable future requires collaboration across all sectors, not just education. So educational institutions must work together with businesses, governments, and nonprofits to enable this. Established companies and institutions can contribute through internships, traineeships, vocational training, and apprenticeships, which provide youth with hands-on experience. They can also fund and support youth-led initiatives that aim to do the same. Governments can create policies and incentives that promote green skills and nonprofits can provide resources and support for educational institutions and in, in initiatives, sorry. It is this, it's through this collaborative effort, this ecosystem that we can build a resilient and skilled workforce. And now to the youth in the room. Many young persons have expressed to me a desire to better understand what skills they can develop to prepare for the scaled up opportunities for education and employment that will need to be created to achieve SDG 7. The Careers in Sustainable Energy Handbook recently developed by SE for All aims to plug this gap by providing a resource that allows youth to better understand the wealth of opportunities that exist in the clean energy sector and how they can build the right skills that employers are seeking. It provides insights into various roles, outlines the skills and education required, and shares inspiring testimonials from young professionals in the field. This handbook is really an essential guide for anyone looking to enter the sustainable energy sector and doesn't quite know how their, how their skills and, and the, the part that they might play looks like. So in conclusion, the urgency of developing green skills cannot be overstated. And it's essential for addressing our environmental challenges, driving economic growth, ensuring a sustainable future, and empowering the youth of Africa. By equipping Africa's youth with the right skills through education, collaboration, and empowerment, and providing them a great share. So let's invest in our youth. Let's support them and empower them to be the change makers of tomorrow. Together, we can harness the power of green skills and pave the way for a brighter future for all. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Akil, for setting the tone. I know we had a little hiccup with a power outage, but I guess this is the essence of us talking about the energy sector and building the skills required for us to have more reliable energy sec um, energy transmission systems in our communities. And yeah, um, you have set the tone for this discussion, and I really like um, how you underpinned the wide ecosystem of skills and opportunities that exist for the youth demographic that will enable them to tap into the energy sector and um, progress it. I, you have also mentioned the careers energy um, careers in sustainable energy handbook that I have dropped in the chat a link for um, our viewers and our attendees to read um, when they get the time. So before we start with our panel today, um, I see there's so many activity on the chat. Please keep on introducing yourselves. I see attendees from Sierra Leone, from Nigeria, from Kenya, and it's really special to have you here for us to progress this discussion. As much as we're bringing in the experts to tell us um, more about the green skills, we also need you to also provide um, uh, questions and feed into the conversation so that we have a dialogue on this topic. And so our panel for today, I'm really excited because they will give us a multifaceted approach to explore the diverse skills required for the future workforce in the clean energy sector. Um, and in case you have any questions for them, feel free to use the chat function. As I had mentioned earlier, we have a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions along the way, just drop them in and then we can address them later on. Now, um, to the heart of the matter, let's drive, let's dive straight into it, shall we? I will start with um, Efiani. So Efiani is an esteemed energy professional and sustainability consultant who envisions a sustainable energy future. He presently serves as a, a program manager of the guided projects with student energy and is committed to nurturing and igniting the next generation to accelerate the energy transition. Holding an MBA degree and a master's in energy engineering, Efiani has a unique blend of commercial and technical competencies which influences his approach to problem solving. His unyielding dedication, robust knowledge, and fervent passion have positioned him as an indispensable voice in the climate change discourse. Efiani believes that youth are vital to the energy transition. His efforts have influenced hundreds of young professionals in the energy sector, inculcating green skills in them for a clean energy future. When he's not working at student energy, Efiani volunteers for noble causes and loves spending time watching football. So Efiani, to start us off, in your opinion, what are the top two green skills that you believe are critical for young professionals and entering Africa's energy sector today. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Chirup. Um, so nice to be here. Um, so just to cut to the chase, for the two skills I'd say are really important, I'd go with communication skills and project management skills. Communication skills because every human being has to communicate. It's like a basic um, for is very basic for social interaction. And you'd be surprised how important and how influential that skill can be within the industry. Project management, because we're always working on projects and um, there's always a start time and uh, an ending of a project. So having pro strong project management skills means that you come into the industry and you can support so many great projects that are ongoing to accelerate the energy transition. Thank you very much. Thanks, Efiani. So communication and project management, the way in which you express your ideas and you express what you do and how you do them is important. And also project management in um, managing timelines and deadlines and um, moving the needle in implementation in terms of projects. Okay. Um, next up, we have, let's go with Shivani. Shivani has five years of experience in supporting youth talent in the tech and climate space across Africa. She is currently the partnership lead at Shortlist Futures, where she designs and implements large-scale programs 
focused on creating youth and entry-level job opportunities. She collaborates closely with donors, governments, enterprises, and educational institutions to deliver these workforce-enabled enablement solutions. Prior to Shortlist Futures, Shivani served as the talent lead for BFA Global, where she oversaw the talent management and sourcing for the Catalyst Fund and the TECA programs. In this role, she supported early stage fintech startups and entrepreneurs developing solutions for financial inclusion and climate resilience in emerging markets like the blue economy in East Africa. So Shivani, I'll ask you the same question I asked Shiva, um, I asked Efiani. What do you think are the top two green skills that you believe are critical for young professionals in the energy sector today? Uh, yeah, so I, I may not give exactly top two skills, but I think in my view, cru most crucial green skills for young professionals entering Africa's energy sector are basically transferable skills. So while we know that you come from a technical expertise and it's invaluable, uh, particularly for those with engineering backgrounds or science backgrounds, the sector today heavily relies on everyday roles. And it's, it's already mentioned by Akhil as well. It's like project management, HR, finance, sales, marketing, all of these roles are super important. And so I think it is necessary for our young professionals to harness their soft skills, whether that's problem solving, whether it's critical thinking, creativity, willingness to learn, as long as you have drive and passion to be able to want to move into the sector and think about how you can move into this sector the skills that you currently possess are very, very useful in the climate sector as well. Um, and so I think it, it you, from a perspective, just think of it like how would you be willing to take what you are currently doing and impact it for a business that is in a different sector, let's say climate, but um, still relevant to your, your background and your skill set. Okay, that's well put, Shivani. So from what I understand and what I'm gathering is that there are core skills that each and everyone has in our respective um, buckets of professions, but there are those in-between skills that can that you can gloss over from one, one to another, right? And so um, for Shivani, I see there's a comment in the chat. Um, that someone, uh, he's called Watson Muryuki, says big up to Shivani and Cassandra on the podcast. So I think that comment was for you and Cassandra. And then last but not least, I will move on to Charlene, who's our third and final panelist for today. Charlene is currently an associate director within the energy innovation portfolio at the Bezos Earth Fund, the only philanthropy with a sole focus on climate and nature to date. She served as a manager with RMI's Energy Transition Academy. This academy supports senior and mid-level energy practitioners in utilities, government agencies, academic institutions, and private sector entities through capacity building to advance the clean energy transition in the global south. Charlene has over 13 years of experience in the clean energy with a focus on sustainable energy program and project management. She was also one of the project development and gender expert and the team lead for the project preparation facility at the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, CICRI contributing to the center's critical first operational phase as the Caribbean Implementation Hub for Sustainable Energy. Charlene's experience extends further back to a previous role as a senior energy specialist with the government of St. Lucia, highlighting her success in renewable energy policy and strategy development, sustainable energy program management, renewable energy project management, and capacity building. Pairing her technical expertise with other passions, she is highly passionate about accelerating an equitable transition, and she has provided leadership on RMI's Women in Renewable Energy Network, and also served previously as a part-time program manager of the network, then managed collaboratively by the Caribbean Electric Utility Services Corporation and the Clinton Climate Initiative. So over to you, Shalene. What do you think are the top two green skills critical for young energy professionals? 
Thank you. And hello, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, really difficult to answer that question last, um, as my two colleagues would have stated, um, very critical skills. I, I wonder to support communication, but take a different angle. I would say stakeholder engagement. I think coming into this space, um, young people must know how to interact with the community, but also interact with your government leaders. So interacting, being able to interact, communicate effectively, um, understand the needs of, um, and uh, simply align with so many within the ecosystem at all levels, I think is critical. Um, project management, I think that speaks for itself. So I won't repeat that, but there is another, not necessarily a skill, but something else I think that um, I really think and want to encourage young people to pay more attention to, and that is being innovative. So innovation, and I say that because um, African countries, our small island developing states, and, and the rest of the, the global south, we depend so much on being importers and um, receivers of technology. And, and, and when I speak of innovation, I speak of being able to innovate, not just in terms of technology, but um, end-to-end value chain, across the entire value chain that we experience with the energy transition, being able to innovate with business models and approaches. Um, I think maybe that these are the two top ones that I would want to, to leave with our audience today. Thanks, Charlene. And I think we can all appreciate how diverse our panelists are and they're giving different angles of the same question, like green skills range. Um, the top skills are very, very much diversified. And as Charlene mentioned, you have to be able to innovate in whatever categories that you are in terms of technology or if it's in business models, as well as um, stakeholder engagements, know who are the actors and the players in the field and how can you bring them together to progress what it is that you're trying to achieve. And speaking of stakeholder engagement, um, I think I would like to move to Shivani. So your role at Shortlist Futures involves this collaboration with the stakeholders to create job opportunities. I'd like to um, find out from your experience, can you share how perhaps partnerships can be effectively built and leveraged to drive the green skills development for the youth in Africa? Yeah, so I guess from my experience, and everyone knows that the Africa renewable energy sector continues to grow. We're attracting more companies, either from outside to set up home base in Africa, but then also wonderful entrepreneurs studying um, climate led initiatives in Africa itself. And so for us, it's very important to build and leverage effective partnerships to be able to drive green skill development for youth. So one of the strategies that we focus on is collaborating with clean energy companies across the, the continent by understanding what their specific needs are. So every company has different specific recruitment needs, specific skills that they need for them to, to join. And so we do this in, I guess, twofold. The first one is we provide funding to create job opportunities or green jobs to support these companies in hiring junior and mid-level professionals by offering stipends to offset the cost. So the goal is to be able to drive our youth to be able to then get these like, um, with these skills within the climate sector. Um, we also know that startups can sometimes be a risk averse and may not want to just hire a lot of junior individuals. And so through shortlist, we're hoping that the stipend and the bespoke, uh, the bespoke support where we uh, provide high, potential candidates from our database is able to to lead to more green jobs within the space then this is this dual approach of like one providing funding where companies can create green jobs and two providing stipends where existing companies can um, hire individuals to support with their needs helps companies grow but also equips young professionals with necessary skills and experience to thrive in the sector so by aligning our efforts with what the industry demands we ensure that our partnerships sort of contribute to both sustainable development and expansion within the, the green economy but we try to be as flexible as possible with our partnerships and really hear what the companies on ground need um, and then tailor how we can support them and support the youth um, both ways. Thanks, Shivani. Um, so for Shortlist Future, what you do is um, finding, enabling these companies to 
match them with the talent that they need and the talent with the skills that will be critical and useful to the running of their programs. And I would like to turn over to Efiani because he works from the other end, working with equipping young professionals to be able to match up and um, build their capacities so that when they come to platforms such as Shortlist Futures, then they'll be ready to take on whatever next step that they want into their careers. So Efiani, I know you have been very instrumental in nurturing the next generation of energy professionals through student energy. Can you share some successful strategies or programs that have effectively engaged youth in the clean energy sector? Yeah, thank you so much, Chirup. Yeah, so as mentioned, I work with Student Energy and as Student Energy, we are a global charity that's focused on empowering the next generation of energy leaders. And we do this by basically empowering them, educating them, building their skills and also creating platforms to unite um, these young um, energy professionals. So we have a suite of programs by which we um, accomplish this. Um, and I'm going to spotlight two in particular, just because I have been engaged directly within these two programs. The first is the career training program. And within the career training program, what we do is basically helping young professionals who are looking to break into the energy industry, um, but they just can't do it due to existing challenges. And this is something that I personally am experienced. So it's something that is so dear to my heart, supporting these young professionals. From experience, we see that the tertiary education that's provided um, doesn't really help people to break into the industry because there is a gap. Recruiters are telling you, oh, you need some level of project experience. Um, you need certain skills before we can hire you to work in the industry. And then you're asking yourself as a young professional, how do I get these skills? I have kind of ticked all the boxes I possibly can. I've gone to school, I have studied, I have come up with a degree, but I just can't seem to break in. And that's where the guide training provides um, an intervention. So basically we empower these young people through a four month based program and we give them access to um, projects, real world energy projects. And we also pair them with um, project partners who come and submit like a list of projects to us. So we pair them with these projects and through the program, we are empowering them with the technical skills they need. We're also empowering them with the soft skills, which we have kind of touched on in the previous round of questions. Some of the soft skills that are needed as well. And at the end of the program, they have something that they can use to justify and say that, look, we have done this, we have built this um, skill over time, we have worked on this project, we have worked with these organizations, and we believe that we have um, a place on the table. So I, ultimately, at the end of the program, they are able to break into the industry, and that's really exciting. Another pro program that I would like to talk about is the guided project, still around the realm of um, project management. With the guided projects, we empower young people with the funding, with the coaching, the mentorship, and the education they need to become problem solvers within their communities, resolving some of the energy challenges they face. And young people come into this program and identify um, a project they want to work on, maybe electrifying um, a local library um, or a, bringing about um, some intervention energy intervention within their community. And we support them through the project development life cycle, such that they come in, they identify the site, and ultimately they develop this technology and deploy, and the project hosts are happy. So in a nutshell, some of the strategies that we have employed within these programs, first I would like to touch on is mentorship, uh, mentorship engagement. So when people come into our programs, we provide them with that platform where we invite those who have gone before them, those who are more experienced and more exposed, and then they come to the program and share wisdom with these young professionals. You agree with me that not everyone has the opportunity to attend, say, a COP29 or COP28 or some high-level energy conference, and the opportunities for engagement with professionals in the industry are somewhat thin. But within the programs, 
we bri we bridge this gap by inviting these professionals and creating platforms such as we have currently where people could ask questions and get guided and it always fills me with joy when i see young professionals who through this um interventions have been able to guide the, uh, shape their career trajectory and are doing very well one last point i want to touch on is the opportunity for real world energy projects uh, when people work on something hands-on it gives them more confidence and through the experience that they develop while working on this project, they are more confident as actors within the energy system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Efiani. I like how passionate you are about the projects and the programs that you 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 guide and lead. And um, from a personal standpoint, I myself have gone through the career training project and I was part of the powering healthcare systems. Um, pro program with SE for all so somehow I came full circle and one of the takeaways that I got from the program is like when I was making the jump from my academic um, graduation for my undergraduate and jumping into the professional field it was a big gap and I personally found that student energy enabled me to to make this seamless shift to working in the energy sector and for that it's a really really um, amazing program that I would encourage anyone who's struggling with something similar to sign up for. And it's absolutely free. I know you haven't mentioned that. It's totally, completely free. And so I want to shift gears to Charlene. Um, we talk about, we've talked about training and um, skilling and building the capacities of young people. So my question is, how can the public sector, the private sector, and philanthropic organizations work together more effectively to scale up the green skills training in programs in Africa? Thank you, Shirov. And uh, I'll start by saying that the ecosystem around green skills training is undeniably complex. And, and so, you know, when I think of these various players, your private sector, public sector, funders, um, varying challenges are experienced um, across the ecosystem by each of these groups of players. And so I think step one is to uh, dismantle some of the silos that exist within the, the ecosystem. Um, it, it, it really is that we must create a synergistic ecosystem um, that agrees upon a common goal. Uh, and so when I think of what that common goal is, I think it, it, it is quite simple, though complex. It really is closing the gap between supply and demand. We have the paradox of the, the growing green job opportunities or green skill opportunities, while we also have um, a significant shortage of green skills. And so there is that gap. I think the, the most, the simplest version is that we must close the gap between the supply and demand um, with our various roles. And so I would say step two is understanding individual roles. I say that because our experience is that there are so many gray areas, gray areas in that you have your funders, philanthropy coming in and trying to figure out where they can make a significant change. Um, and some of these areas may overlap with the role of government. And so I, I think, you know, as a second step is establishing what the roles of, of these significant players are. For example, I think of government as always being an enabler and that the enabling environment. I leave that up to government. I think that is government strength, that is the public sector strength, um, and that will facilitate that transition that encompasses these green skill uptake. Um, I also think of, and we speak about green skills in the context of a just transition. And I think that one of the critical role of the public sector is to ensure equity and, and we, the public sector or government must manage the systems of disruption. And, and when I speak of system of disruption, you know, I think about ensuring that all those who need to be trained or have access to green skills, the playing field is not leveled. And so there's a certain role that we expect government to come in and to ensure. And, and government can do that by establishing partnerships between the business side, the industry side, 
and your educational institutions. And then the private sector must really adjust its approach to talent development. I think um, Shivani spoke a little about that, how uh, folks are recruited, um, you know, just even the mindset around recruiting. Um, if Annie mentioned, you know, companies always wanting uh, experienced folks, but how can we bring our training um, approaches closer to the field so that folks coming out of training um, programs are well equipped and that businesses, the private sector is ready to take on newer uh, or, or less experienced um, trainees into the system and of course work with them. And then philanthropy, of course, I'm on the side of philanthropy um, and it's not always as easy as it seems. It, it might seem like it's an easy deal to just give out the money. We need money for training. I think um, a philanthropy having a slightly uh, bigger appetite for risk that perhaps your government agencies or your private sector simply don't have the, the ability or, or, or the privilege of, of having that risk appetite. Philanthropy must take some big bets. Um, philanthropy must operate within spaces that nobody else is operating. Philanthropy must enable, must, I think, blaze the trail, create opportunities that are catalytic, proof of concepts, new business models, that now philanthropy could come in, you know, create these, again, proof of concepts, enable the private sector, and then move on to, to, to something else, but not that continuously, for example, just providing money for a, a training here. And the other challenge around that is that our approach to green skilling, whether it be reskilling, and, and we mentioned transferable skills, which is another big topic as well, but our approach sometimes has all of these legacy gaps. And by that, I mean, it's one-off trainings and we don't ensure that coming out of that, we have quality jobs. And we want to ensure that young people, as they enter the sector, they're assured of having a quality job and not just a temporary job. And so, you know, I think um, philanthropy has the potential to support catalytic synergies. And I really want to stress that we have to be catalytic with what we do. Time is against us and we simply cannot um, train people 10 by 10 or 100 by 100. We need to be catalytic and it has to be scalable. Thanks. Thanks, Shalene. I do agree that time is ticking and industry really has to streamline um, and come to um, an understanding of like um, how their role is in the terms of um, building green skills. And I know the context varies in from region to region, but the skills remain the same. And these skills need to be taken into consideration and built from the different sectors, whether private, philanthropic, public, and so on. Um, I'm just looking at the time and we are at the bottom of the hour. I know this is a conversation that we could go on and on and on and on about because um, there's lots to unpack. Um, so I will just roll off the final question to all the panelists and I will start with Shivani. So the final question for today is, do you have, um, can you highlight some emerging opportunities in the renewable energy sector and also within your organization that you um, young professionals should be aware of. Yeah, cool. So I guess we all know that Africa is the emerging, like has emerging opportunities for renewable energy. We have like 40% of the world's renewable energy in Africa alone. So that potential is immense, immense itself. And there's, we know there's rapid expansion in solar wind energy projects across the, the content, continent. And that offers a lot of roles, right? Project development, installation, maintenance, but then also these transferable skills and in business roles, which is HR, sales, marketing, um, and, and yeah, sales, marketing, project management. And so I guess for the opportunities that are out there, it's just for young professionals to explore what roles they're interested in and how they can be part of um, this sector if it is truly what they want to be part of. I would also suggest just taking the risk. Sometimes I know when you say that, oh, I come from like a finance background, how can I be working in this clean energy sector? I came from a finance background and I'm working on, pro I started at project management and now running climate led talent initiatives. I have no HR background, no uh, project management background. And so I guess it's just taking that risk. Um, and I think through the way you can find these jobs, I know there are a lot of job boards and there are a lot of opportunities out there, but some of the things that we're doing at Shortlist is the first thing is that we have two 
um, clean energy programs that we run. There, the two of them are called, one of them is called the Energy Access Talent Initiative, funded by um, FCDO through the Carbon Trust. And the second one is Women for Green Jobs, that is funded by GIAP, Global Energy for Alliance for Our People and Planet. And both of the, the roles, both of the programs ideally are supposed to place junior and mid-level individuals in mid-level individuals across clean energy slash climate companies across the continent. And so that's, an, uh, that's a really cool opportunity for young people that are looking to start within this sector, because firstly, you have access to, I know we all say like, where are the jobs? Like go find the jobs, but where are the jobs? And so I guess that is what we're trying to uh, shortlist is be like, here are the jobs that you can access. The way you can access them is you can check our shortlist professionals website. We have a database called Talent Gallery, which has access to all of these jobs. But secondly is through our Afri Africa Climate Careers Network, uh, where we're trying to bring together like-minded individuals across Africa to one, be able to see what climate jobs are out there. Secondly, um, what provides training so like the podcast is one of the things where we have conversations with like-minded individuals to share what's going on in sector so you're well up to date and third peer-to-peer -peer engagement so through the africa climate careers network we have a job board and the roles that we are posting from women for green jobs and energy access talent initiative will be posted there but we have other jobs that we pull um, basically we pull from different databases and house them on our on our platform so you can see what roles are are out there. And yeah, I, I want to suggest is if you think they're too senior for you, maybe they say two years of experience and you have one year, I'm telling you, please apply. Like if you have transferable skills and you think you're able to apply, just go for it, take the risk. You never know who will say yes. And from there, you'll be able to start a career within the space and never know be a leader within the sector as well, which is what we actually need um, from young individuals across Africa. Thanks, Shivani. I particularly like that Shortlist has taken the time to cluster all these opportunities in one place. So you just have the, the website and you have many different types of opportunities that you're looking for. And I know there are so many questions on the chat that there are so many programs being thrown around. I will collate all of them and then circulate them on an email later on with all the links so that you have, um, you don't miss out on any. And then I would like to move on now to Efiani. I know you had already touched on the guided projects and the career training by student energy, but do you have other opportunities, emerging opportunities that you can highlight um, either in your organization or within the energy sector that young professionals should be aware of? Yeah, definitely. Um, so within Student Energy, we also have the fellowship program, which is an eight month program that gives you comprehensive understanding of energy systems. Um, you also get to work on the project. Um, you can also work within teams. So someone who maybe comes from a non-technical background that wants to have a robust understanding of energy systems and where they can get involved, um, the fellowship program is another exciting program. Um, so in terms of other opportunities, personally, I'm someone who, when I was coming up, I tried to look out for different engagement op um, opportunities, different capacity building opportunities, and even YouTube is a vital resource. So just a few days back, I was going through YouTube because I was trying to look for energy modeling related uh, um, courses and all. And I saw that it had like proper resources that one could digest and enhance their energy knowledge. So if you're someone who is interested in learning more developing skills, I would say you can take advantage of the free platforms. You could also reach out to different organizations. I know some of them are paid, and but student energy programs are unpaid. So look out for opportunities within student energy. Um, as Chirop mentioned, there's going to be an email and I'm happy to share more resources, but also take advantage of the ones that are open out there, open source that you can use to learn. Very, very vital. 
Thanks, Sefiani. And also to mention that feel free to follow this organization with the Bezos Earth Fund Student Energy Shortlist um, Futures and Professionals on LinkedIn, just in case so that if they post something new, you will be the first to know if you check your LinkedIn regularly. Um, last but not least, we have Charlene, and I would ask you the same question. If there are any opportunities you'd like to highlight, both in your organization and in the renewable energy space in Africa. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I can't speak to any immediate opportunities within our organization. However, maybe just some sharing some wisdom is working in this philanthropic space. And this is my first time working with a philanthropy. So I'm coming from a project background into being on the other side and really thinking beyond the next 10 years and the next 20 years. Um, and, and so perhaps my a word of advice would be for young people to also, again, I have to stress, be innovative. And that's what I am coming across in this role. We're seeing a lot of young minds um, who are thinking outside of the box and not just going with the, the traditional come out of school and get a job um, and, and are also just themselves being unafraid of starting their own business or going into the, to, to, to their, their own journey um, to enable the energy transition. So I think maybe that is an area that I, I want to stress. Um, you know, we, we talk about financing and there is funding out there. And what we're not seeing enough of is young people taking these um, chances or, or being brave enough to take these chances to innovate and plug into funding sources. Um, a number of philanthropic organizations are just waiting for the next young person to come up with the next big idea. We have proven technology, but what are some of the other uh, approaches that we need outside of technology, these business models, come up with new models. Um, so I, I just really want to encourage young people to, to take that road as well. It's not for everybody, I understand that, but um, we certainly must think outside the box. Thanks, Charlene. Certainly, certainly, words of advice is also an opportunity in itself. And we've heard from our panelists, um, they all are continuing to progress themselves. Like Charlene has mentioned, innovate. Innovate and reinvent yourself as many times as you can to um, match yourself with the opportunities. We've had Chivani, she started from finance background. Now she's in project management and then starting to um, have like the resourcing for um, um, uh, talent resourcing. And we have Fiani, who's always on YouTube learning um, more skills than he already has, adding to his quiver full of arrows, but he's still continuing on. And this is a reflective moment for me to just think about also myself in a personal standpoint. Um, what do I need to progress? Where do I want to be? And what skills can I um, equip myself with to get to where I want to be in the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, and how do I need to innovate? So thank you very much, Charlene, for that. And now for the very special segment, and this is about you who is attending this webinar, what questions do you want to pose to our panelists while they're here and they have a listening ear and they have an opportunity to respond to you? And I can already see we have Christine, Christian Shimon. Um, you've raised your hand. So, Christian, please feel free to unmute yourself. My name is Christian Shimo. I'm attending uh, from Rwanda. It's very, very good session going on about the youth in energy sector. I really like how the panel is and the engagement in this uh, topic of youth in energy sector. And my, my question is, uh, like, uh, young young professionals in the energy sector, you may have those skills, but when you go to the short list, uh, um, based on my experience on short list, I was uh, trying to find like internship in energy company, an energy company here in Rwanda that was uh, uh, posting a job in short list about energy intern. And uh, you feel the form, but I was, I was expecting like to to find those challenges to work on certain assignments. It was like experience of filling a form and get rejected. But when when it is particular of uh, resourcing or finding someone who who is able to do that job, 
uh, it is very crucial and very essential to assign him a task to do that. And once he finishes that task, you may judge it by yourself, but by doing like, okay, you have to do this in order to improve yourself, not only by rejecting them. Uh, that's why uh, when it comes to rejection, uh, it is very, very disappointing for young, even uh, young driven professionals when you find like, okay, I get rejected for several times. Okay, I'm keeping trying, keeping trying, uh, seek for another resources, uh, get engaged in, in several meetings, reading books. But uh, when you look at it, you find yourself like, okay, I have this background, I have these professionals, but I may not find somewhere to do that job because uh, I can't find anyone who can trust me and assign me this task and do that and able to convince that, that okay, I'm currently uh, known as someone who can do that job. This is very crucial problem that uh, a very young professional, uh, I, I, I think like it's not only me that's having that problem because uh, some people can't find like, okay, the examination in resources, Maybe it is because we don't have those uh, backgrounds. We don't have like uh, uh, we we have not attended a European universities. When someone from Europe come up with a uh, uh, European degree, it is it is push you to outsiders. Maybe uh, it is very very crucial problem for young African boys attending like universities in in African uh, countries because nobody is accepting that. Maybe uh, it is the problem with the hiring manager. Uh, maybe it is that also, maybe it is the system. I know some system like right states here in Rwanda, where they have like this system of hiring by giving the exam. Maybe you may fail, you may fail that exam, but you, you gain that experience of doing better. When you find another one you go to, you, you get you get uh, another exam, you know how interviews are made, you know how uh, things are done, you know everything in that field, you get to know that what type of examination, what ex question that they ask uh, as energy engineer, you must know this, as energy modeling engineer, you must know this, or okay, as young professionals, you must know this, this and that. That's very crucial problem. Yeah, that's that's my uh, my, my thought on this. Um, Christian, do you have any particular panelists who'd like to answer? I mean, I would assume it's Shivani because of the shortlist. But do you, do you want to directly direct it to one specific person? Yes. Yeah, so yes, yes, of course. Uh, I find like uh, shortlist has this system of violin. And then mm -hmm. someone in panel who is in shortlist as uh, as a read partnership personnel in shortlist. That's why I came up with the shortlist experience. But mm -hmm. uh, it is it is very common. Okay, so Shivani, would you like to take it away? Yeah, I guess no. I understand where people are coming from. Where like the way our process works, where you apply and then um, you fill out a few questions but then you may not get like a reason to why you are rejected for a particular role. Just to, to state the way, the way shortlist and our process works is that you apply on talent gallery, like on our platform, which is called talent gallery. But from there we have you on our database. And so based on those, on those skill sets, we try to match individuals that are based um, on their background. So for example, let's say if, um, you have like a, you've studied HR or you, you haven't even studied, you've gone through a vocational or a technical institute for IT or some tech training. We don't actually specify to find candidates that are only going through universities or they've gone from international degrees. We actually very rarely uh, place individuals that come from international degrees in our, in our companies across Africa. Um, and so from there, like, yes, you may get rejected once, but I guess on, on our part, we can take it on and be like how we can provide more tailored feedback. But I would also suggest maybe thinking about how you can continue applying for all the roles that we are sharing. Our recruiters are also very open to providing feedback if you ask them. So if you email the, the recruiters 
that have posted the job, they would be willing to give you feedback or you can even reach, the, reach out to them through, um, through LinkedIn, their names are Grace and Gladys. So they're happy to provide you more information on how to tailor your CV, how to tailor your application. But beyond that, maybe also attend some of our sessions that we're talking about CV training, how to like, what we had, we had a really cool uh, podcast episode where we talked, it was with our head recruiter and like, how can you like tailor your CV and your job and your pers basically your online persona to be able to be fit for a particular role. So I guess um, there is some of the few tips that I can give from what we're trying to do. We try to be as inclusive as possible. So try to have people from across Africa. Uh, if our role is in Rwanda, we only hire people from Rwanda unless stated otherwise. Um, but yeah, I, I guess thank you for the feedback and something that we will bring up with the team. Thanks, Shivani. And Christian, I hope your question has been answered. So Shortlist does not just provide, provide job boards. It provides much more than that. So reach out to um, send follow-ups and you'll get um, feedback. And then there's a question by Kilonzi and you've asked two questions. So I'm just going to pick one because I know we're almost running out of time. We have five more minutes. And the question is, how do we prove innovation as the youth? what is meant by this sweeping term? And I think I will address this question to Charlene because you brought up the point of innovation. So over to you, Charlene. Thank you. Uh, a good question. I think when I speak of innovation, um, again, I, I want to stress, it doesn't only refer to technology. We've spoken about project management being very important. We've spoken about um, projects being at the center of the energy transition where, you know, th that is a center point of green skills. Um, so when I speak of innovation, I speak of uh, coming up with, well, one, there is the technology side, um, innovating in, in terms of the technology, but coming up with business um, imperatives. So how are we simply going to always, and, and I say that in full transparency, when I look back at my career, if I had to do anything different, it would have been that. It would have been that I would not want to always or only depend on the job market to provide me with an opportunity, but I would want to also create opportunities for myself to develop a business, to, to, to be brave enough to venture forth into a startup company, a startup company that can offer something different that is not being currently offered, that we know that is needed um, with the transition. I mean, the, the continent, the African continent is rich in resources. And I think you said that, Shirok. How do we make that work for us? What are some of the models that we could come up with? I mean, we're leaving behind the earth for, for the, the young people, people like me and and Shivani and, and Ifani will not be here um, in decades to come. And, and the earth really belongs to you. The transition belongs to, to the youth. And, and so it, it cannot always be that uh, as young people, we're just waiting for jobs to be created for us. That is also important. And again, not everybody will fit in under that, that umbrella of innovation. But I certainly, um, in this last role, I have been convinced, um, and I say that because there is money out there, and I want to stress that there is money out there um, that can facilitate these creation of jobs. From the side of the philanthropy, I will tell you that philanthropies are looking for the next new idea and not necessarily will put in funding into what is already being done. And so what are the new ideas? We need our young people to come up with these new ideas around which you could create a career um, that could really fuel the transition. Thanks, Charlene. I think that is very well put. Um, last but not least, we have one last question and I'll direct this to Afiani. Uh, this was the first question that came through earlier when we were having this discussion and it reads, organizations are undergoing unprecedented transition to clean and green energy. This is a big change um, management process. How is it? How is this different from other transitional changes, and how can these organizations manage employees' ability to change, acquire new skills, and maintain mental wellness? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, transitions happen um, from the organizational standpoint. Is 
be important for them to also be open to new ideas on how they can um, make best use of it, take best use of the current situation and how adaptable they can be. Um, for the young professional, um, there's also something you can do. You can position yourself to also be of value. As Charlene said, um, innovative, being innovative. And you don't, one thing I just want to share as a, a takeaway is that you don't always have to wait or react to what is out there. You can be proactive. There are different ways to get into the industry. It doesn't have to be see, always seeing a job ad and applying for that job ad. You could meet professionals on, in networking sessions. You could also go out there and put out your CV, put out your work, be visible on LinkedIn. These are some ways you can get attention. You could also be innovative by looking out for reports, looking out for projects that have been um, put out and making your comments, your own observations. It could be that in that organization, there is nobody who saw a particular problem. And by your comment, you have drawn the attention because you have demonstrated that you are able to identify problems and solve problems. So these are ways that you could also like play a big role within the energy transition. Um, the energy transition is upon us right now. Everyone's looking to shift. Um, what, how can you help organizations who are trying to shift? Many times the problem is it's going to be very expensive for us to transition. Could you come up with innovative ways or business uh, models that could reduce the cost of these organizations by providing that value? You are definitely making yourself indispensable. So this is something I think would be a great takeaway from the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Efiani. And I think that's an excellent note to put a pause to this conversation because we can never really exhaust what we have to talk about. I would like to thank everyone for making the time to attend um, this session. Thank you to the panelists for making the time to provide the insights on progressing this conversation. And um, our next webinar will be on gender mainstreaming in SDG 7 and the role of local communities in the energy transition. The date and the time um, will be communicated, so keep an eye on our social media platforms. And this session will delve into the importance of gender inclusivity in achieving SDG 7, as well as how local communities can play a pivotal role in the energy transition. We encourage you to stay connected and continue the conversation about sustainable energy and green skills because your involvement is crucial in shaping a sustainable and inclusive future for all. Have a fantastic day and goodbye.